Welcome back, everyone, as we dive into parts seven and eight of Extra Histories, Justinian and Theodora. I want to give a big shout out to Alexander in Washington, D.C. and Will in Kansas City. Thank you for your continued support through Patreon. As always, our patrons and members will be able to see the next parts of this series uh, a day early. So when this one goes live to the public, you'll already be able to see parts nine and ten. So make sure you check that out if you get a chance. As always, the links are in the description, not only to take you all the way back to the beginning of this series, but also for you to see the original content without my commentary. Let's pick up the story where we left off. Last we left off, Belisarius had finally broken the siege of Rome. Reinforcements had arrived. The Ostrogoths had fallen back to northern Italy to prepare a last defense for Ravenna, the capital of the late Western Empire. It looked and here's a chance to throw in my living in Northeast Ohio. In Ohio, like a lot of places, all of our towns are named for somewhere else. <laughs> and I swear we have a town for every major city in Europe here in Ohio. And Ravenna is one of them. Ravenna, Ohio is like 20 minutes from me. Like soon, Italy, the birthplace of Scipio, Caesar, and Augustus, would be back in Roman hands. But with new forces came new commanders. One of these commanders was Narses, the eunuch who had helped Justinian suppress the Nika revolt. Another commander who had just started coming to the fore was a man named John, who led the main cavalry detachment. When these reinforcements arrived, Belisarius ordered John to range north, to raid and loot and capture what he could, and to leave no enemy behind him lest he be cut off. So you have a couple of options here if you're Belisarius, right? One option is you keep pursuing them, you keep the pressure on them, or you stop, you consolidate your gains, you dig in, you've got the prize of Rome, if that's all you're after. And then you communicate that to Justinian and you kind of sit on your loyal, laurels and let your guys take a rest. But the problem with that is you have an enemy who's already thinking about taking it back. And so by keeping the pressure up on him, you keep him feeling that he's in the weaker position, you don't give him a chance to regroup, and you keep the pressure up. So that's what he decides to do here. John flew north with a speed and fury unmatched. He ravaged the countryside and scattered armies before him. Then he came to Oximus. Here there was a strong garrison of Ostrogoths, well armed and ready for war. He decided that his cavalry was not the proper tool for such a siege, and passed by this city on his way north. Then again at Urbinus he did the same. But when he came to Ariminum, the Roman population threw open the gates, and seeing their defense lost, the Ostrogothic garrison fled. So John, knowing that Ariminum lay only a day's march from Ravenna, seized the opportunity and took the town, hoping that it would force much of the Ostrogothic army in the field to withdraw to their capital. And this it did, for the most part. But as the Ostrogothic... So this, again, is a really common tactic that has been used, not always successfully. A perfect example in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which is uh, the big American offensive of the First World War. Uh, you've got this really difficult terrain in the Argonne Forest, and so you can attack through it, which is going to cost you a lot of casualties and probably meet a ton of German resistance and slow down the entire 25 mile or so front. Or you do what the Americans and the French decide to do, which is bypass it. The French army will bypass it on the west side. The American army will bypass it on the east side. We'll link up on the north end, and hopefully the Germans, realizing they're cut off from the rest of their force, will pull out of that strong position. Didn't quite work out in that situation, and it may or may not work out here. Ostrogothic forces retreated north. They strengthened their garrisons at the towns that John had left behind. So Belisarius sent swift messengers with word to John to abandon the town of Ariminum and rejoin the main Byzantine force. But John refused. And by twice not heeding Belisarius's orders, first by leaving uncaptured towns behind him and then again by refusing Belisarius's direct order now, he found himself cut off, surrounded, and besieged. Jeez. At Firmum, Belisarius called a council of war. All his generals assembled. He laid out his plan. They would take a cautious approach north. It was tragic, but he would not risk the whole army to save John from his insubordination. But it's not just John, it's 2,000 cavalry as well. But I, one of the things I love about Belisarius here is that he doesn't just unilaterally make these decisions, right? He calls together his commanders and lets them have a say on it. Now, whether he does what they say or not, he at least lets them feel like they've been heard, and he gives them a chance to voice their support or opposition to the plan. For the most part, the generals murmured in agreement. 
But then, in the back, Narcy stood up. With a wave of his hand, he said that John could be dealt with later if they were to relieve the city, but the loss of 2,000 of their best cavalry yeah. without a fight would be an unconscionable failure of command. Just then, a ragged horseman burst into the council tent. Having clearly ridden hours on end, he unsteadily stumbled toward Belisarius and handed him a letter. It was from John. His forces were on the brink of starvation. Mm. They could last seven more days, and then they would have to surrender. Reluctantly, Belisarius agreed to Narcissus' plan. They would relieve Ariminum. The eunuch smiled. John was his friend, or at least his political ally. Wheels were turning out of Belisarius's control. So Narses uses the argument of, well, there's 2,000 cavalrymen we've got to save. And it sounds noble that way, but he really wants to bail out his friend. And he, it, probably his thought process is, all right, if we can bail these guys out, if we can rescue them, then maybe Belisarius doesn't come down quite so hard on John. So Belisarius drew up a new plan. He would relieve Ariminum, but as was always his method, if he could, he would do it without having to fight. So he split his armies into three sections, one which would head to Ariminum by sea, one which would march up the coast, and another which would descend upon it from the mountain mm. passes to the northwest. But the force that was to head up the coast wasn't to engage. It was simply to approach the Ostrogoths and then at night light many, many fires so that they appeared to be a massive horde. And this is a tactic that has been used literally for millennia. Lighting a bunch of fires, move a bunch of guys in front of it, and you can you know, make them think that there's more of you than there are. It was used in the Old Testament uh, in a way where you have the, uh, the famous story uh, in uh, the New Testament of... Um, the story of Gideon and how he takes 300 men to attack this massive force. They surround the army at night while they're camped. They have hidden fires that they then break uh, the clay pots that are around the, uh, the fire so that the fires all appear at one time. They make a bunch of noise and they trick the army into be, believing that they're surrounded by a massive force. So this has been used for a long time. And if you have a lesser commander who... D who doesn't really think outside the box the way you do, he's going to see three separate forces coming at him and think that he's got a massive army descending on him, not that a small army split itself into three and attacked. And then the next morning, the sails of the fleet would appear on the ocean, and the banners of the remaining force would appear from the mountains. And the Ostrogoths, seeing that they were surrounded, would flee. Mm. And unlike most things in military planning, it worked exactly as planned. As soon as the ship's sails appeared on the horizon, the Ostrogoths besieging Ariminum broke and ran. Had John's cavalry not been so depleted by hunger and exhaustion, they might have been able to end the war right there. But instead, a gaunt and haggard John stumbled out of Ariminum to be greeted by Belisarius, who suggested that he thank the commander of the seabound forces for his rescue. Instead, John answered that his thanks were to Narses, and the cracks began to spread. Narses was the one who pushed for them to relieve John, but it wasn't his plan that made it a reality. Narses and Belisarius disagreed on the strategy. Much of the original army was loyal to Belisarius, as he had seen them through so much, but a great number yeah. of the new troops saw Can't Narses as their commander. After all, as they saw it, without him, they would have lost Ariminum, John, and the 2,000 men with him, when instead they had easily driven the Ostrogoths back without a fight. Didn't this clearly show that Narses knew what he was doing? Besides, Narses controlled their pay. Uh. All of this finally came to a head around Mediolanum. Mediolanum was the second richest city in Italy. It had supported the Roman cause, and now it was under siege by the nephew of Vitiges. Belisarius wanted to focus much of the Byzantine efforts on relieving it. Narses said that this was inefficient, and he would take his forces elsewhere while Belisarius handled Mediolanum. But this was it. Belisarius was putting this. his foot down. He cracked out a letter that Justinian had sent that read, In sending Narses, our purser, to Italy, we do not invest him with the command of the army. It is our wish that Belisarius alone shall lead the whole army as seems good to him, and it behooves you all to obey him in the interest of our state. But Narses, being well practiced in the ways of the court, seized on this last sentence and proclaimed, Your plan is not in the interests of the state. Belis now, he also did say, Belisarius is a command of the army and he gets to use it as seems best to him. That's pretty unequivocal. But what Narcissus is doing here is buying time. He knows that it'll take time for Belisarius to get clarification from Justinian. Justinian will come back and say, absolutely, you obey Belisarius no matter what. But in the meantime, Narcissus can do what he wants. 
and that's a nightmare situation. Sarius had no answer to this. He would not risk open conflict with the second most senior commander, so he consented to march with Narses and John to take Urbinus and secure the road to Ariminum before relieving Mediolanum. And so the three armies marched, theoretically united, but very much a tripartite force with diff- Now, there's, there's a couple of schools of thought on this, right? On the one hand, you definitely can see the need for one person who is the, the one, the buck stops here, you know, the, the person who makes the final decision. You had Dwight Eisenhower in Europe in the Second World War. You had, in the late stages of World War I, Ferdinand Foch, who was the Supreme Allied Commander on the Western Front. Uh, somebody who's going to make the final decision so there can't be these kinds of fractures in uh, command. On the other hand, it is good to have people who have strong enough voices that they can keep the commander in check if he goes off the rails. In this case, though, it seems pretty clear that Belisarius needs to have overall command and be the one who makes the final say. Different commanders at its head. And when they finally got to Urbinus, they set up three separate camps. Shortly after reaching Urbinus, even though coming here had been Narses' idea in the first place, both John and Narses decided that eh, it was impregnable and took off. Narses headed to Ariminum to threaten the Ostrogothic capital, and John charged off into the countryside to make short work of Forum Cornelii and collapse another Ostrogothic province. But Belisarius stayed, and with that remarkable Belisarian luck, in this town which every other commander had said was impregnable, a town that was so well supplied and so well defended, suddenly, and for no explicable reason, the town's spring, their only source of water, <laughs> ran dry. Without water, the defenders surrendered to Belisarius in a matter of days. But the siege of Mediolanum was getting worse. So now at this point, if you're John and Narses, I mean, how do you even argue that Belisarius isn't the guy, right? You left him high and dry, and then he won the siege you said couldn't be won even without your forces. Force of 10,000 Burgundian warriors had crossed the Alps to join the Ostrogoths. This was far mm. too much for the beleaguered Byzantine garrison to handle. Belisarius sent out a force to relieve the garrison, but when they saw the size of the opposing army, they stopped in their tracks and just stayed there outside the city. One night, a messenger from the commander in Mediolanum braved enemy lines and reached the relieving force asking for help, which they promised right away, but still they didn't move. Finally, the relieving army asked for reinforcements. They asked that they be sent John's forces, which were in a neighboring province. Belisarius agreed and sent the order to John right away, telling him to come assist the relieving army in repelling the siege. But John refused. He would not obey the order yeah, unless it was countersigned this. by Narses. Now so, a bunch of people are going to die because of your petty squabble and you can't submit to authority. And again, Belisarius is going to write off a letter to Justinian, I'm sure, but it's going to take time for that to happen, time this garrison doesn't have. Exasperated, Belisarius wrote to Narses to sign the order, which he did without hesitation, as clearly Mediolanum needed to be relieved. But then John fell ill, or at least appeared to, and the relief effort was delayed again. Ugh. Reduced to eating dogs and mice, the forces of Mediolanum were in dire straits. The Ostrogoths offered the troops honorable captivity, with their life and their status as free the men troops. intact, if they would open the town to them. The Roman commander in Mediolanum replied that he would accept, so long as the people of Mediolanum weren't harmed. But the Ostrogoths made no secret of the savage... So Mediolanum is an example of one of these towns that was under the Ostrogoths, and they have rolled over for the Romans. The Ostrogoths aren't going to let them get away with this. There has to be a message sent to other towns that they don't do that. And the only way you send that message is that you sack the town vengeance they wished to wreak on this town that had so quickly embraced the Romans. Inside, the Roman commander tried to rally his forces for one last desperate sally against the force arrayed outside their walls, but hunger and fear had taken their toll, and so, with outside help apparently not coming, the garrison at last Vanity. surrendered. Days later, Vanity the relief force him. finally arrived. They had seen dark smoke from the road. As they approached, all was quiet except for the crows. The walls were rubble in places. The great gate stood open. As they walked through, they were greeted with a sight of horror. Bodies and ash as far as the eye can see. Bodies in numbers unfathomable. Mm. Tens, maybe hundreds of thousands, laying in the black soot. Every man in the city had been slaughtered. Every woman and child had been dragged off as a slave. Then the Ostrogoths had put the town to the torch, and nothing of it remained. 
Amongst the rubble, they found the body of Reparatus, the Praetorian Prefect of Italy, and the brother of the Pope. He was barely recognizable, his limbs chopped into pieces, his body savaged by dogs. This was the first sign that the Romans might not be able to protect the people of Italy. Yeah, this is going to have a ripple effect, because now all the other towns that you were hoping to peacefully subdue, they're going to resist, because they don't want this to happen to them. It's a powerful message that's been sent. Things were only about to get worse. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next part. Mediolanum had fallen. Its catastrophic destruction reverberated through Italy, and yeah. then through the entire Roman world. Belisarius penned a letter to his lifelong friend in the East, Justinian. There was an anger to this letter that Justinian had never seen from his friend. The letter laid out just how this tragedy came to be, and just who was at fault. Justinian immediately recalled Narses, and with the order to recall Narses, he sent another letter. There would be no equivocation this time. All of Italy would know Belisarius was in command. And with a semblance of unity restored to the army, one by one the remaining Ostrogothic strongholds fell. By this And see, I think it was always Justinian's intention that Belisarius have that authority, but sometimes when you're giving orders, you don't necessarily think through all the ways that someone might try to interpret it to their advantage. And so sometimes you have to make things crystal, crystal clear. And that's what he's had to do here. Unfortunately, it's too late for the men and women who were killed. Spring of 540, Belisarius was at last at the gates of Ravenna. Victory was so close. He lay siege to the city, and when Vitiges' nephew came to lift the siege, he sent John, who, yes, was still in service, to capture the towns to the east, where the families of most of the soldiers of Vitiges' nephew's army lived. As word of this passed through the enemy ranks, the army melted away almost overnight. Mm. With no chance of rescue, Vitiges... See, these are unconventional things that he's doing at times, Belisarius, but this is the stuff you have to do to win when you don't have massive advantages in numbers and when you're deep in enemy territory. You've got to think outside the box, and my man is doing a good job of thinking outside the box. ...began to negotiate his surrender. But even as he and Belisarius began to talk terms, there was a shift in the wind in the east. Back in Rome, Justinian looked out over his city. A new capital. Not just because Constantine had founded it when Rome began to fail, but because he had reforged it. The Hagia Sophia stood complete. The palace was more magnificent than it had ever been. And soon his new capital would rule over the old homeland. He had retaken Africa, and now Italy. Perhaps one day he would reconquer Hispania. A messenger woke him from his reverie. A letter. It took him but a minute to read what it said. Then he ordered, pen, paper, quickly. Fetch the senators Domnicus and Maximin. In that instant, those dreams of empire left his mind. Now he was a man trying to balance on a knife's edge. Vitiges had not been idle. Mm. While they'd been closing the noose on him, he had written to the Persians in one last desperate gamble. He had told them how much of the Byzantine force was tied down in Italy. And now that wow. is... <laughs> the enemy of my enemy is my friend. This is out-of-the-box thinking, right? Th these guys have no real reason to be allies except that they have a common enemy and they happen to be on either side of that enemy this is gutsy and it's a, it's amazing that he was able to even get this message through this just goes to show you too that this idea that sometimes we have that everybody who's not a roman in europe at this time is somehow a barbarian there's some kind of godless heathen uneducated and really just a you know a big mob of guys descending on the Romans from the trees. No, these were very well organized uh, government systems that they had in place with ambassadors and with monarchs and with uh, a structure of authority and with towns. And, and, you know, they were really not all that different than the Romans. Eternal peace, that peace that he, Justinian, had paid so dearly for, was coming to an end. Two senators rode up to the command tent of Belisarius' camp. It was strange, they lacked the usual baggage and hangers-on of senators. Their entourage was only a small bodyguard to get them through the ravaged countryside. Belisarius bade them enter, and asked why they'd come. War has come to the east, they said. You are needed in Constantinople at once. We bring the emperor's terms for the Ostrogoths. We've gotten Vitiges to agree. Now your signature is all that remains. 
Belisarius took the paper they offered him, the peace agreement they had just given to Vitiges, and with each line he read, he became more and more filled with rage and dis- You're upset because you've put all this time and work and you've lost all these men fighting for what you've got, and now all of a sudden diplomacy enters, and you're stuck in a situation where a general wants to fight, but he's being ordered to stand down and come east to fight another enemy. Disbelief. Vitiges would remain king of the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths would get to keep all land north of the Po. They wouldn't even be seizing all of the Ostrogothic treasury. This was outrageous. He had committed so many years of his life to this fight. He hadn't battled starvation, fought against insubordinate commanders, and sacrificed the lives of countless men just to give up now. Not now. Not when they were days away from achieving everything that they had planned so many years ago. He turns to the senators. I won't sign it. I don't believe these terms came from Justinian. Without yeah. an order directly from him to sign such a piece of ignominy, my pen will never touch that page. He knew full well that even if Justinian actually wished him to sign it, it would take weeks, perhaps months, for such an order to arrive. And by then, he would have already crushed Ravenna. But as and this is a common thing that people do. General Grant did this in the early days of his command in the West, where... He sent a message to General Halleck, who was his superior in the West, basically saying, I'm going to move my army to such and such a place, and I'm going to attack the enemy there, unless I hear from you telling me not to. Knowing full well that by the time word would have gotten, him, gotten to him to not do it, he would have already won a victory. As word of his rejection spread through the camp, one by one his generals came to tell him that they disapproved of his rejection of an imperial decision. And so he called a great council of his generals and asked them if they would have him approve of such a deal. Unanimously they said yes, mm. and he said that that exonerated him from any future troubles that may come from not defeating the Ostrogoths. He summoned the senators back and offered to sign, but the damage was already done. Word of his refusal had not only passed through his camp, but made it to the halls of Ravenna. Uh. The Ostrogoths now suspected a trap. If Belisarius, the only Roman they saw as honorable, refused to sign, something what must be mess. wrong. And then, slowly, an idea made its way through the ranks of the Ostrogothic nobility. What if they were to go back to the old ways, the ways that came before the reign of the Ostrogothic kings? After all, Vitiges had failed them, and the royal ancestral line of the Ostrogoths was nearly lost. What if, instead, they raised a new man to once again become the emperor of Western Rome? And soon this idea took root, and secretly the Ostrogothic nobility sent out a messenger to Belisarius, the Roman they trusted most, the man they respected on the battlefield and off. They offered him the crown of Western Rome. Even Vitiges, when he discovered this plot, urged Belisarius to say yes. And this is, again, this shows the intelligence and the guile that the Ostrogoths have. This is a gutsy play. And I mean, there's really no downside to it, right? Wow. And so Belisarius called together all of his commanders and the senators from Rome and posed to them a question. If I could, without assaulting the city or wasting one more life, capture Vitiges, bring all of Italy under imperial dominion and bring the entire Ostrogothic treasury back to Constantinople, would you support me? And around the room, he got a resounding yes. And so, he agreed to the Ostrogothic proposal, and marched his army into Ravenna. But once inside the walls, he exposed his real intentions. To claim Italy for Justinian, to seize the royal treasury, and to bring Vitiges captive back to the east. He made sure that... Ostrogoth's big mistake here is they were counting on the vanity of Belisarius. They were counting on him to see dollar signs, so to speak, to see an opportunity to have a kingdom of his own, to have it all be for him instead of for some other monarch miles away. They weren't counting on the loyalty that he had to his friend. That no further Ostrogoths were harmed, that no looting was done, and that no property other than the royal treasury was seized. But even so, the Ostrogothic nobility was stunned. Here was the noblest of the Romans lying to them, breaking an oath to them, treating them in bad faith. The Ostrogoths raised up a new leader, but even he pled with Belisarius to take the throne of Italy for himself. Once more, Belisarius refused. And so, at last, five years after Belisarius had first sailed for Sicily, Italy was conquered. Justinian's dream was complete. 
But in the end, it had not been captured by force of arms. It hadn't submitted to an honorable peace or even fallen to a noble ruse. Instead, in those last few hours, it had fallen to broken oaths and bad... Yeah, but all of that was set up by force of arms, by uh, tactical and strategic genius on the part of Belisarius. So it, it's a combination of those factors. It's just the crowning achievement of it happened through deception. Bad faith. And there are always consequences for broken oaths mm -hmm. and bad faith. Some are felt soon after. Others are buried as seed that sprout only in the darkest winter. And as Belisarius sailed home at last, his longtime friend sat in his palace, feeling suspicion and the pain of betrayal. The East was in turmoil. The border regions were already at war, and it was all because the man he trusted most in the world had disobeyed him. When his need was nearest, it seemed he could not count on anyone but Theodora. This friend, this man that was nearer to him than a brother, had allowed one of the mightiest empires in the world to threaten Byzantium, to sate his own ego and ambition. The Ostrogoths had been broken. They could have always been conquered a few years down the line. But those months, those precious months that Belisarius had spent on the vanity of a complete conquest, those months might mm. cost them everything. His legions and his best generals, they were all in Italy. Byzantium herself stood exposed and undefended. And then there was the matter of the crown. What was he to think of the fact that Belisarius had accepted the Western crown? Sure, he had betrayed the Ostrogoths and told them all that he would never take a crown while Justinian lived, but he had accepted Imperium, and that does something to a man. And yeah. he had betrayed Justinian to do so. And what of the fact that clearly people thought he was suited to be emperor? How do you put such a man at the head of armies? And we talked about this all the way back at the very beginning, right? That it was a common thing in the history of the Roman Empire that when uh, a political or military leader got too powerful, they went from being a hero to being a threat. And it seems that Belisarius has crossed that line into being a threat to the emperor. How does the emperor respond to this? How do you trust such a man without reserve? And so with these doubts and with bad faith built on good intentions, the cracks begin to grow. Join us next time as the two greatest empires in the Western world come to blows and the cracks begin to ripple outward. All right, we're going to wrap it up right there. I want to give a big shout out to Justin in West Des Moines, Iowa, and Alex in Lacey, Washington. Thank you guys for your support. Check out some of these other videos that I'll throw up on the screen. Thanks for watching.